morning and welcome. And to our colleagues tuning in around the world, good afternoon or good evening. As your host, I'm delighted that you are joining us to address the big marine questions at our Admiralty Blue Data Conference, developed by the UK Hydrographic Office. At this critical time for our global seas and oceans, our Blue Data Conference brings together leading experts in ocean science, marine data and the blue economy to explore the transformative power of blue data. Together, we seek to address some of the defining questions for our ocean industries and the marine environment. Today, we've invited opinion leaders to share their insight and expertise on the key challenges facing us across three main themes. The blue economic opportunity, data and sustainable development, and the future of navigation. Our speakers will discuss some of the critical questions across these topics. Due to the unprecedented situation we're living in, and in order for us to follow the latest government guidance at all times, the panels and discussions you're about to watch have been pre-recorded and filmed ahead of today. While they may look a little different as a result of this, we're confident that the discussions are all timely, relevant and engaging. I'm sure that you've already familiarised yourself with the platform we are broadcasting on. As you will see, there is a live chat facility on your screens. We have speakers and UKHO experts online ready to answer your questions. So please do send through your thoughts and join the conversation. We will also conduct live polling throughout the conference. So we encourage you to share your opinion. To open the conference, I would now like to welcome the UKHO's Acting Chief Executive and National Hydrographer, Rear Admiral Peter Sparks, and our Chief Customer Officer, Catherine Armour, to say a few words. This will be followed by a short film about the importance of blue data, which we hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Admiralty Blue Data Conference. Today, we have brought together leading experts to discuss how marine geospatial information can help address a number of the contemporary challenges and opportunities that our oceans and inshore waters present. From shipping's digital revolution and the growth in autonomous vessels to the enormous potential of our global blue economy and the urgent steps we need to take to meet our sustainable development goals. These discussions come at a critical time in an era of unprecedented population growth, and with millions of people reliant on our oceans, it's essential that we find new ways to unlock the latent economic potential, whilst arresting a decline in the health of our vital marine environments. The decisions we make on how we interact with the world's oceans and our coastal waters are becoming ever more consequential. Our choices today and tomorrow need to be the right ones for future generations. To make the right choices, we need the right decision support. When data is translated into information and then knowledge, it can then help to guide our governments and support our navies whilst enabling commercial shipping and emerging blue economy users to realise the potential of the maritime domain. We also have a global responsibility to help to protect those nations and populations that are most exposed to extreme weather events and climate change, and to better enable them to defend their endangered marine habitats. As a mariner who has operated in some of the world's most demanding maritime environments, I am well aware of the need for the most accurate and up-to-date and assured navigational data. I've spent many years at sea, trusting in the accuracy of Admiralty charts and publications to keep my ships and my crews safe. Admiralty is a hallmark that the world's mariners place great store in. The UKHO team is rightly proud of this trust and confidence, but it is a responsibility that we do not take lightly. We believe very strongly that we must strive to offer the best possible support to masters and their crews, so that they may ensure the safety of their ships and people at sea, whilst delivering compliance and operating efficiencies across the sector. We are always looking to the future, so that we may catalyse evolution and track emerging trends within the blue economy. 
We are currently working with international partners to develop and implement the next generation of digital charts and services through the S100 product suite. In doing so, we are building a new data framework that will help to optimize the efficiency of maritime operations in shipping, defense, in support of autonomy, and across the myriad of industries that utilize our increasingly busy oceans. By way of example, the UK government's recent pledge to invest heavily in offshore renewable energy heralds an exciting era of growth in the blue economy. We have much to offer in support of that. And as we begin the UN's decade of ocean science for sustainable development, we continue to work with vulnerable coastal communities across the Caribbean and the Pacific to help them gather, assess, curate and present their own blue data. By harnessing and presenting the power of this foundational data, coastal communities are now better able to understand and develop their marine environments and economies and counter the effects of climate change. It's exciting to observe how these changes could potentially help create a better future for us all. Of course, data is just one key element and our global marine community depends on our ability to work collaboratively to meet our mutual goals. By bringing you together today, we hope to encourage and promote this collaboration and to establish new partnerships that can help to unlock the tremendous power of marine geospatial data. So I would encourage you to watch each of these talks, perhaps even those that you hadn't considered previously, so that we might build a shared understanding of our rich and diverse maritime community and to forge new alliances. By working together, I am confident that we can develop safe, secure and thriving oceans for the future. Of course, none of this would happen without our colleagues from around the globe collaborating and working with us. I'd like to introduce our Chief Customer Officer, Catherine Armour, to say a few words. Thank you, Peter. I'm delighted to have so many of you with us from around the globe, our customers, suppliers and partners. You've given up your valuable time to join us today because we have these three things in common. One, we care about our seas and our oceans. Two, we agree we need to protect our precious marine resources. And three, we share a belief that better marine data, the latest digital tools and modern data science is at least part of the answer. Making the right choices about the responsible stewardship of our oceans the right choices to protect our most vulnerable communities and the right choices to unlock a prosperous, sustainable future for what we call the blue economy. The heart of this is marine geospatial data, or blue data. Only by harnessing the power of this data can we hope to reach a future where our oceans are safe, secure and thriving. The data we hold is collected by ships, buoys, satellites aeroplanes, underwater vehicles and more, not just by us, but by our many trusted partners around the world. A great example of this collaborative approach is the Admiralty Marine Data Portal. Not only are we adding a growing number of data sets, we're also making this data more accessible than ever. We want to encourage others to explore this data because of the sheer potential of what can be achieved, both to inspire new commercial opportunities and to address some of the biggest challenges we face. Today, we can use tidal data and bathymetry to identify areas likely to be impacted by sea level rises, as well as predicting the impact of storm surges and extreme weather events. Informed decisions can then be made on how to protect these vulnerable communities. We can also use satellite data to track environmental change, and you'll hear more about this later. Marine geospatial data can also be applied in other exciting ways that have the potential to support ocean sustainability, at the same time as growing our ocean industries. For example, marine data has a pivotal role in supporting the green energy revolution, identifying coastal and offshore sources of renewable energy, such as wind and tidal power, and reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. If we're to build a sustainable, thriving blue economy, it'll be a team effort. We need to work together to promote the use of accurate, trusted blue data in a way that equips decision makers with the evidence and the insight to guide their choices. 
Get involved with the conversation. Use the hashtag MarineQuestions on your favourite social media platform and have a great conference. Our world is changing. Pressure on our oceans is growing. Every decision we make about how we use the marine environment matters. Data about everything from the seabed to the surface has never been more important. This blue data can help solve real world problems and shape the future of our oceans and how we use them. Our charts are derived from a wealth of blue data, including bathymetry showing the depth and nature of the seabed. Mariners across the globe rely on them to navigate safely and efficiently. Bathymetric data becomes even more powerful when it's combined with other blue datasets. As we enter a crucial period for the future of our oceans, blue data will help inform a range of important decisions about the use of the marine environment and will play a critical role in addressing the challenges faced by coastal communities around the world. Especially when it's advanced by data science, enabling us to handle and process vast quantities of data using satellite imagery to map the world's coastlines, helping locate and monitor mangrove forests which are vital to our coasts, and guiding efforts to protect these environments so they stay healthy and resilient for years to come. As our oceans continue to change, so will the way we use them. Innovation is at the heart of this, transforming the maritime industry and driving new standards that will change the way data is collected and shared. The more data we have access to, the better we can help people around the world make key decisions with confidence. So we're increasing the number of data providers we work with, making our own data more accessible and creating new and better ways to help our customers. Together, we have the technology and expertise to tackle tomorrow's challenges and meet the needs of an ever-changing world. Together, we can use blue data to ensure our oceans are safe, secure and thriving for the future. Thank you, Peter and Catherine, for your words and for kicking off today's event. I think we can agree that marine geospatial data will have a particularly important role to play in addressing some of the challenges and opportunities facing our ocean industries. Hopefully, from our short film, you can see some of the exciting ways in which blue data can be used to unlock these opportunities if we come together as a global community. From shipping and defence to offshore renewables, we need to harness the opportunities presented to us in a way that doesn't jeopardise the marine environment and its resources. That brings us to our first theme, unlocking the potential of the blue economy. Before we, before we move to our first keynote speech, we would like you to get involved. As you can see, we've already opened our first poll. What we would like to know is, which area of the blue economy are you most interested to see develop in the coming years? Marine finance and insurance, maritime industries from global shipping to port infrastructure and services, international development and aid, such as sustainable coastal development and habitat protection, or ecosystem services, including developments in offshore energy. And feel welcome to share any particular sectors that interest you in the live chat. Together, these markets make up the blue economy, which is estimated to grow to a value of £3.2 trillion by 2030. And in recent years, we've seen firsthand some of the exciting developments and disruption across all four areas. From global shipping through to offshore renewable energy, the blue economy is a vast and almost completely untapped well of economic and social potential. Governments, international regulators and commercial partners understand the potential of the blue economy, but we must now come together to decide how we move forward. With this, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, James Bidwell, the co-founder of Reset and the chair of Springwise. 
Using their research, he will be exploring some of the changes and disruption facing the global blue economy, from innovation and technology to the need for more sustainable practices. So now I'd like to hand you over to James. A vast source of potential, a well of economic and social opportunity, worth £3.2 trillion by 2030, and employing more than 40 million people. The blue economy is evolving, disrupting existing sectors, opening new horizons. But what is the blue economic opportunity? How is it changing? What does it mean for our daily lives? The world's oceans play an outsized role in our daily lives. Almost everything, from the clothes we wear to the food we eat and even the internet you are using to watch this, has crossed the oceans one way or another. Impacting the way we live and work, the blue economy covers everything from sectors established hundreds of years ago, such as global shipping, to more recent developments, such as the rise of offshore renewable energy. The blue economy, is an enormous market, comprising as much as 90% of world trade and expected to be worth over three trillion pounds by 2030. Rich in natural resources and home to over 50% of all life on Earth, it is from the blue economy that we derive livelihoods, drive socioeconomic development and preserve our planet. In recent years, we have experienced a huge pace of change. A new blue economy is emerging. Established sectors are being disrupted and new sectors emerging, paving the way to a smart and sustainable use of the oceans. And the best thing is, we are only on the cusp of unlocking the opportunities and full potential of this blue economy. One exciting area is the emergence of AI, of artificial intelligence, driven by recent advances in big data, data science, and cloud computing. AI is unlocking innovation across the blue economy. This technology is being used by the UKHO's data science team to further their understanding of the marine environment. By combining open source satellite imagery and computer vision techniques, they have automated the creation of coastline data for the UK and other areas around the globe. We've also seen significant developments in the maritime transport sector, driven by digitization and breakthroughs in navigation. Such innovation has the potential to disrupt the entire shipping industry, a sector expected to be worth £64 billion by 2030. In particular, Autonomous vessels could impact everything from route planning, fuel optimization and safety, through to the understanding and modeling of risks in the maritime insurance industry. Powered by 5G, a powerful combination of connected ships and smart ports can produce an internet of things at sea, enabling real-time inventory tracking, enhanced security and optimized fuel consumption. Already, we have seen the digitization of some of the world's largest ports, such as the port of Rotterdam, which uses automated guided vehicles, automated terminals, and collects real-time data from smart sensors, enabling improved safety, operations, and scheduling. We are now faced with the challenge of managing this ever-changing infrastructure and its increasing energy demands. How can we unlock new growth opportunities sustainably? and without hindering future generations? How can we prevent the overexploitation of natural resources? This is vital, not just for healthy and thriving oceans, but the survival of our planet. As we continue to develop and benefit from the blue economy, we can and we must put sustainability first. We're seeing a green energy revolution Alternative fuels are powering ships and decarbonizing an industry. 
energy storage solutions are contributing to the viability of marine renewable energy, from offshore wind to tidal and wave. These have real impacts on our lives. In the first quarter of 2020, almost half of Britain's electricity generation was produced by renewal, renewable energy, driven by a surge in solar and wind. The UK then hit an energy milestone by running coal-free for 55 days. Besides seeking zero carbon emissions, we must also reduce existing levels of carbon in the atmosphere. The restoration of coastal ecosystems can also play a major role in this. Our oceans are a giant sink for over 90% of climate heat and a quarter of global CO2 emissions. Half of this carbon is sequestered by mangroves and other coastal habitats, which are up to five times more cost-effective than man-made coastal protection structures. To locate and monitor the health of these vital e ecosystems, the UKHO is using deep learning techniques and satellite data to map mangroves across the globe. As well as capturing carbon, they act as a natural sea defense. So an understanding of the location of these mangroves can make a real difference for coastal communities. The health of these coastal ecosystems is put in danger by marine waste, pollution, and plastics. As consumers are becoming increasingly conscious of potentially adverse environmental impacts, traditional sectors such as tourism and fishing are adapting. Marine ecotourism is set to grow at 6% each year, with three in four travelers believing that we now must make sustainable travel choices to save the planet for future generations. Fishing supply chains are seeking to reduce waste and to adopt transparent processes. Innovative financial instruments such as blue bonds can align the incentives of the fishing industry and the interests of marine life helping reduce the large proportion of global fisheries currently operating at unsustainable levels. Across the entirety of the blue economy, in sectors both old and new, data is a key enabler in unlocking vast economic and social opportunities. The UKHO is in an unparalleled position to support this transformation by collaborating with data partners across the globe. By leveraging data, we can not only optimize existing sectors, but also invent new ones. Innovation and technology are defining the evolution of the blue economy and its impact on coming generations. Our future is unlocking a deeper understanding of the world's oceans. Our future is ensuring a sustainable, prosperous environment. Our future is blue. The stakes are high, but the opportunities are boundless. It was great to hear from James there. It's fascinating to understand how oceans and related sectors are intrinsically linked to many parts of our daily lives and how the blue economy plays an important role in the way we live and work. As we continue to innovate and as the adoption of AI and other technologies become more widespread, we can expect to see even more disruption in established sectors and a number of promising new sectors emerging this means we should all be positive about the prospect of a smarter and more sustainable future for our oceans. Thank you for your questions and comments on the live chat. It's good to get the conversation going. And remember, we do have a few of our own experts online today. So please do keep your comments coming in and we'll do our best to respond. We are now going to look at data in a bit more detail, particularly marine spatial data infrastructure or MSDI. The UKHO holds a wealth of marine geospatial data from the seabed to the coast, offshore and beyond, many of which are available via the Admiralty Marine Data Portal. Marine data portals can play a key role in developing a thriving blue economy by making data discoverable and accessible. And now, through some of our hydrographic programmes, the UKHO is supporting other coastal nations to create data portals that will help support their own data management. Here to explain a bit more about this is George Hewish, 
Product Manager at UKHO. George will provide an overview of MSTI, how it can support disaster resilience and government infrastructure, and how we approach the task of building a data portal for Anguilla through the Overseas Territories Seabed Mapping Programme. Over to you, George. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. I hope wherever you are in the world that you and your families are safe and well. It's a privilege to have been asked to speak to you today about MSDI and the exciting work the UKHO have been doing to support countries in unlocking the potential of the blue economy using marine geospatial data. But what is MSDI? Why do we need it? And how can it be implemented to support a thriving blue economy? MSDI stands for Marine Spatial Data Infrastructure and is the marine component of an SDI or spatial data infrastructure. There are numerous definitions and variations on what an SDI and therefore MSDI are, but simply put, it's a framework of suggested best practice and guidance for the management of geospatial data, underpinned by some key principles supporting interoperability, integration, institutional collaboration and coordination. A spatial data infrastructure is scalable, meaning it can operate at an organisational, national or even international level. In all cases, the key principles of good data management apply. These principles seek to make geospatial data discoverable, accessible and reusable, so that all users can access the data they require whenever, wherever and however they need it. The UKHO are currently transitioning to an MSDI operating model by adopting the UN GGIM Integrated Geospatial Information Framework, or IGIF. This framework proposes nine specific pathways which build on other models of MSDI that focus primarily on technology, standards, data and people. UNGGIM advocate developing each of the nine pathways in unison to ensure a stable foundation on which to build and evolve. But what does MSDI mean to the UKHO? The digital revolution that has unfolded in recent years has seen one of the most radical transformations in the depth and breadth of the marine geospatial data now at our disposal. We've seen a transformation in the way it has been gathered giving unprecedented scale and range. Moreover, we've seen new capabilities emerge as we immerse ourselves in this data. The possibilities of what can be achieved are extraordinary. With this in mind, the UKHO believes in making data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable to ensure where permissible, it is available to anyone who needs it. We also believe that MSDI is not an end state. It's not something which can be easily implemented using technology alone, but rather, MSDI is a constantly evolving ecosystem of the nine pathways, including governance, data and partnerships, and which can only be achieved when each is developed equally and iteratively. But how can MSDI and geospatial data support disaster resilience and the blue economy and government infrastructures of the countries around the world? Over the last 70 years, over 500 natural disasters have hit small states with developing economies worldwide. Of these, over 300 were in the Caribbean, home to a predominant share of small island states. The Caribbean region is particularly at risk from natural weather events, such as hurricanes, which typically form over the Atlantic, some as far away as the west coast of Africa. 99% of these storms travel east to west across the Atlantic, and when combined with the warm waters and humid climate of the Caribbean summer months, are fuelled further. The resulting winds and subsequent waves and flooding can be devastating to the coastal communities of these low-lying small island states. Moreover, the livelihoods of more than 100 million people who live on or near the coast are supported by the Caribbean Sea's ocean economy through tourism, fisheries and aquaculture. And globally, over 3 billion people worldwide rely upon food from the ocean as their primary source of protein. However, for far too long, there has been little thought given to the ensuring that the growth is sustainable, balanced or fair. As much as 40% of the world's oceans are heavily affected by human activities, including pollution, depleted fisheries and degraded coastal habitats. At the UKHO, we hold terabytes of data, which include comprehensive bathymetric data covering the UK, the British Overseas Territories, countries for which we are the primary charting authority and Commonwealth nations. We have 7.5 million profiles on temperature and salinity, tens of thousands of marine mammal observations and seabed grab samples, as well as many other data sets collected by us and by our partner organisations. There's great potential for all of this data to play a key role in supporting sustainable economic growth and helping coastal states to mitigate the risks associated with the ever-increasing number of natural events. 
As technology improves our knowledge of the deeper offshore waters and our capacity to access them, a number of new opportunities have also emerged and are gradually being realised. These include the current interest in deep seabed minerals, ocean energy production and marine genetic resources with medical, pharmaceutical and industrial benefits. We can also combine the same data with other environmental data sets to support the development of habitat maps, to monitor the impact of warming oceans on key marine environments and support conservation efforts. This is especially critical for coral reef systems, which are declining at an annual rate of 1-2% to due to these pressures. Another amazing example of the capabilities we see with marine geospatial data is how satellite data is used to track environmental change. We see this in the development of a new method to monitor changes to mangroves, a tree species found in coastal areas that has significant capacity for absorbing greenhouse gases, but also plays a crucial role in mitigating the impact of tidal surges resulting from extreme weather events, by providing a natural barrier. The more we understand about the importance of coastal wetlands as carbon sinks and as natural sea defences, the more important it is we can map, monitor and manage these resources. As you can see, opportunities to utilise marine geospatial data to mitigate the risk of natural disasters and to support and conserve the blue economy are endless. However, to ensure developing island nations, such as the British Overseas Territories in the Caribbean, are able to maximise the value of the geospatial data which they hold and for which the UKHO collects on their behalf, it is imperative this data is discoverable, accessible and reusable to those who need it. As we continue our transition to an MSDI operating model, UKHO have identified opportunities to further embody the principles of an MSDI by not only making the data available, more discoverable, accessible and reusable, but through other professional services such as training and capability building, infrastructure and governance and consultancy, and bathymetric survey specification and fulfilment. These UKHO professional services are all rooted in the principles of MSDI and underpinned by the UN GGIM 9 pathways. They can and have been used to help overseas territories and small island developing nations to implement the foundations of their own marine spatial data infrastructures, exposing them to opportunities for deriving greater value from the marine geospatial data and in turn stimulating their blue economies. At the UKHO, aligned with our role within the UK government, a significant portion of our thinking is dedicated to how we can expand the frontiers of marine geospatial data in order to help promote safe, secure and prosperous oceans, including untapped blue economic opportunities. For example, through the UK Government's Overseas Territory Seabed Mapping Programme, we're working with other partner organisations to help 14 overseas territories to support shipping and to protect their marine environments. The provision of data through programmes such as the Overseas Territory Seabed Mapping Programme has long been a challenge. Limitations in the data management capability and poor internet connectivity of developing nations coupled with large volumes of data, have historically meant there has been no alternative but to fly the data out on hard drives. This is neither sustainable nor environmentally friendly, and clearly does not aid in making data either discoverable or accessible to the many stakeholders for whom it might support, and from which greater value might be realised. In attempting to solve this problem, we have worked extensively with the Government of Anguilla to develop the Anguilla Data Hub, a web-based portal hosted in the cloud to provide a user interface to an Anguilla marine spatial data infrastructure. Based on the UKHO's own Admiralty Marine Data Portal and built to empower the government in decision making for a better understanding of their seabed, it combines bathymetry collected under the Overseas Territory Seabed Mapping Program with additional and complementary data such as AIS traffic, wrecks and obstructions, maritime limits, seabed composition data and more. These data sets have the potential to be incredibly powerful for example, with this new portal, Anguillan stakeholders could plan port developments with far greater knowledge of seabed and ocean conditions, enabling larger cruise ships to dock and in doing so, provide a significant boom to their tourism industry, an industry that underpins the local economy. Marine archaeologists could utilise a combination of data such as bathymetry, wrecks and obstructions, seabed composition and tidal information when conducting seabed archaeological investigations in sites for potential renewable energy sources, such as wind farms. Coastal mangrove forest coverage could be monitored using the UKHO satellite-derived global mangrove data set and their health and carbon sequestration properties modelled to inform trading activities within the carbon offset market. 
Through machine and human analysis of satellite imagery, coastal infrastructure development could be supported by identifying areas which are most at risk of erosion and therefore help in identifying suitable locations for new infrastructure such as hotels or coastal communities. Furthermore, by combining this data with tidal and bathymetric data, the impact on coastal communities and infrastructure from storm surge and other extreme weather events could be predicted. Informed decisions can then be made on how to protect communities in those locations by fully assessing the risks and the mitigation options. The list of opportunities is endless. Our team worked closely with our partners in Anguilla, from the initial data capture and processing through to development of a proof of concept data portal, associated data services and a subsequent live service, as well as training users to build up long-lasting, future-facing capabilities. These results are encouraging and it's amazing to see the change that's happening, but despite this, there is still a long way to go, with many coastal states subject to massive challenges. At the UKHO, we take our role in supporting developing island nations seriously. MSDI is a complex framework which involves data capture, mapping, standards, policy, governance and training. But with access to high quality, trusted marine geospatial data, overseas territories and their governments, scientists, academics and business leaders will be equipped to make better collective decisions about how to protect their oceans and ensure a sustainable and prosperous future for the blue economy. Thank you for listening. As George alluded to, it's great to see such practical examples of how geospatial data can support disaster resilience, government infrastructure and the wider blue economy. It's also interesting to learn that growing attention is being placed on making sure that this growth happens in a sustainable, fair and balanced way. Now for our second polling question. Having listened to George's insight and some of the examples he explored, what we would like to know is, which of the following do you think would have the most impact on improving your own national or organisational spatial data infrastructures? Data-centric working across the blue data community, working in a way that creates multi-purpose data as opposed to fixed products, shared technical standards such as the S100 product specification, improved policy and governance to promote reuse and interoperability of data, or advances in marine geospatial technology, such as the use of data portals and machine learning. While we can agree that each of the key principles of SDI are essential for managing geospatial data effectively, we'd be really interested to hear your own views. Recent years have seen us come a long way when it comes to technical standards, but you'll hear a bit more about this and what this could hold for the future of navigation in our panel a bit later. Shortly, you will also hear how greater collaboration across our community can support sustainable development, from data collection to policy decisions. A quick reminder that the conference will be available to watch on demand on the Admiralty website, and you can join the conversation via all the usual social media channels, including LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, using the hashtag MarineQuestions. We're now going to take a short break, and when we come back, we will turn our attention to our second conference theme of data and sustainable development and hear from experts who are setting the agenda on the sustainable management of our ocean resources. Do join us again in a few minutes.
welcome back. Thank you for staying with us for the Admiralty Blue Data Conference. We said we would address the big marine questions and in the next section of our conference, we ask, how do we harness the power of the oceans to reach our sustainable development goals? To help answer this question, we are drawing on some of the critical work being undertaken by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. The OECD has played a key role in developing an understanding of our marine environment, creating a series of pioneering reports that provide evidence to help improve research and innovation for sustainable ocean management. These reports have been pivotal in helping to create policies and initiatives that will help reshape our relationship with our oceans. I'll now introduce Claire Jolly, who is Head of Unit of the Innovation Policies for Space and the Ocean at the OECD. Claire will discuss some of the organisation's latest research into the value of marine data and the role it can play in building sustainable and resilient marine economies. Please welcome Claire. I would like to thank the UK Hydrographic Office for this kind invitation to share some recent OECD activities on geospatial marine data and its role in supporting sustainable development. In the next uh, few minutes, I will briefly mention some of our OECD activities on the ocean economy. Then my talk will cover three points. First, the importance of recognizing that geospatial data have different types of value, from scientific to economic value, as to sustain long-term collection efforts. Then second, I will share some insights on mapping value chains from data users' perspectives. And finally, I will briefly mention how the collection and uses of marine data may contribute more and more, but also benefit from official development assistance program. Now, studying the impacts of geospatial marine data directly links to our work program in the OECD STI Ocean Economy Group. As you can see in this slide, we have two main missions. First, in terms of ocean economy measurement, and that's really an exciting field, as we need to know much more about the size and impacts of ocean economic activities. We are developing new satellite accounts right now with a number of countries. But we're also very active in terms of exploring how science and innovation can be boosted to improve ocean sustainability. Geospatial marine data contributes to both our missions. Now, let me share with you the importance of recognizing the value from geospatial marine data. The main rationale is that if we wish to sustain collectively long-term data collection efforts, we need to demonstrate that the research programs and infrastructure um, to collect marine data are actually essential, not only for knowledge creation, public decisions, operations, but also to the larger economy. So geospatial marine data and related products and services may be attributed different types of value from scientific all the way to economic value. A little more than a year ago, the International Ocean Ops Conference took place. It is a large event that is organized every 10 years for the scientific, technical and operational communities involved in the planning, implementation and use of ocean observing systems. Many position and technical papers can be found in the online journal Frontiers in Marine Science, and I recommend you take a look. This time around, the socioeconomics of ocean observations were addressed at length, discussing the impacts of sustained ocean observations in a growing ocean economy context. Some of the issues included, can we link better ocean observations and sustainable development? This is the topic of this event. Are we measuring well the value coming from data flows? And most importantly, the so what question. Is measuring the value from ocean observations making any difference? All three questions got a resounding yes. There are a number of methods that I'm listing here that can demonstrate how geospatial marine data can improve efficiency, productivity, and the cost structure of many ocean-related activities. That includes direct economic benefits, like the sale of information, but also indirect economic benefits. They may include the cost savings that are derived from an information product or service based on ocean observations. A good example, if you use accurate sea state forecast, then you may have better ship routes as a result. And you can value this money-wise by the reduced fuel cost. So there are a few economic techniques that can be applied to demonstrate how this geospatial marine data can help and provide real economic value. And that certainly helps in decision making. 
However, in here, that's my second point. We have a diversity of marine data and growing links between ocean observations and many sectors of the economy. That means that there are many ocean observations value chains to explore. The value chain maps the relationship between data production, data processing, generation of data products, and the usage by different user groups. So in addition to the techniques that I mentioned just before, this is very useful information to have to make the case for marine data. There are some excellent exercises going on, and let me mention here our colleagues from NOAA in the United States with some very good studies on the commercial take-up of marine data products. At the OECD, we have launched a number of initiatives with colleagues around the world on mapping the data flows of selected public data repositories. We work with the Global Ocean Observing System in this, and we conducted this year our first case study with the kind cooperation from the UK MEDIN, the Marine Environmental Data and Information Network. MEDIN allowed us to connect with many UK marine data marine management centers. So we launched a large survey of users, and as you can see here, we had some very interesting first results. The scientific user community is the main driver behind many ocean observations. The initial needs they provide are fundamental for data collection and the further uh, later development of products and services. Now, the operational user community, and that include many public authorities, mainly rely on ocean observations to reduce uncertainty in decision making. What we found in the still rather limited data we collected in our survey is that the seeding of offshore wind platforms and ocean commercial activities in the UK, including new installations for coastal tourism and ports, are now absolutely reliant on geospatial marine data, not only because it makes sense, for their operations and to limit environmental damage, damages, but also because of regulations that require different new actors to make use of the data and demonstrate their sustainability. Now, finally, one last point of the growing importance of geospatial marine data for developing countries in particular. We published a couple of months ago an OECD report drafted jointly with different OECD experts with some new original data on official development assistance or ODA aimed at supporting sustainable ocean economies around the world. ODA for ocean projects account for a very small fraction of global ODA, only 1.6%, and that represents around 3 billion US dollars in 2018. This amount only partially focuses on sustainability. As you can see here, most of the projects that, funded, that are funded by ODA are related to maritime transport and fishing, but there are also more and more projects related to marine protection. ODA also helps align private finance to the sustainable ocean economy through the catalytic use of guarantees, loans, and other instruments. And there, the 2.9 billion in private finance, um, you can find more than 50% uh, dedicated to land-based projects that are crucial for the ocean, such as water treatment facilities and the advances in port install installations. Now, I'm sure you can see, again, the link with geospatial marine data. For all these projects, mapping of the coastlines and seafloors are essential, and the number of uses of data keep growing in the developing world. So to conclude, there is still much to do to use our oceans in a more sustainable way. And we also need collectively greater understanding of the marine environment and of the impacts of economic activities. So to improve long-term sustainability of our ocean, marine spatial data will play a key role. And at the OECD, we will continue building the evidence. So I thank you very much for your attention. Um, thanks. Thank you, Claire, for that fascinating insight into some of the work that the OECD is conducting to support sustainable development. And I would encourage you to read the reports mentioned, and we will make sure that links to them are available via our website. We've seen today some of the diverse applications of blue data and its importance for sustainable economic growth. Now, with Claire's insight into the value of marine geospatial data, we ask, how can we work together to increase the availability of this data to support a sustainable blue economy? To help answer this question, we will now hear from Sam Harper.
As Head of Hydrographic Programmes at the UKHO, Sam leads the delivery of key seabed mapping initiatives that are helping coastal communities to support sustainable development and disaster resilience. This includes the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme and the Overseas Territories Seabed Mapping Programme, which we heard about earlier from George Hewish. Sam will discuss how some of these initiatives are helping to increase the availability of marine geospatial data and how this data can help us move forward in achieving the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, particularly as we enter the UN's Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Over to Sam. Hi there, my name's Sam Harper. I'm the Head of Hydrographic Programmes at the UKHO and I'm going to talk about how seabed mapping and blue data fits into supporting sustainable development. I'm going to start off by talking about what some of the challenges are that we face, looking at how we can work together as a community, but then also have a look at some of the work that we've undertaken over the past couple of years. Now, the nature of the situation that we face as the seabed mapping community and those interested in the collection and management of blue data is that there is essentially a global deficit of data or a paucity of information, you could say. The IHO estimates that in the Caribbean alone, around about 80% of the uh, ocean basin still needs to be mapped. If we move to the Pacific, actually this figure increases to 95%. And I wouldn't want you to think that in the UK, we don't say, uh, face a similar issue. Actually, if we look at this diagram here, we can see that upwards of 60% of our seabed within our exclusive economic zone is still yet to be surveyed. As a hydrographic office, we commonly think about this lack of information globally as being a challenge for navigational charting. And it certainly is. If we don't have modern data, then we can't provide the user of the chart, the commercial mariner, with an, uh, a, a cohesive picture of, of where they can operate and how safely they can. But actually, there's a consideration here for hydrography in terms of a bigger picture. So what I've done here is I've positioned hydrography or blue data as a keystone activity or data type. Um, as that keystone in an archway. So from that very same data that we use for seabed mapping and the production of navigational charts, actually you can do a number of other things. So for example, you can create habitat maps, marine protected areas, that informs fisheries management, coastal zoning, that in turn forms part of your ocean's governance and leads hopefully to a sustainable blue economy. But you can go the other way on the archway. You can use that data to do inundation mapping which forms an essential part of your disaster preparedness. That in turn forms situational awareness. It helps with your disaster response. It allows you to understand your seabed change in the form of an assessment, and that forms part of your disaster recovery. So what we're doing here is we're positioning blue data rightly in its place as the keystone or baseline to all of those critical pieces of, of activity that happen in the blue space. If you take that keystone away, then all of those activities suffer. So the other way to think about how blue data, seabed mapping and hydrography can contribute to sustainable development is in terms of the role that it can play in helping with the mutual delivery of multiple development goals. For example, I've picked two sustainable development goals, 14 and nine. The first deals with life below water. The second deals with infrastructure and innovation. Now in a situation where a, a, let's say, an island nation wants to both protect its food security by the delimitation of marine protected areas, but also wants to develop its port infrastructure, let's say for the development of a new smart port, those competing interests can be married by a clear and holistic picture of the seabed um, and the, the natural environment. So 2021 will see the start of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And what this decade will set out is a delivery framework to go from activities such as seabed mapping through to the societal outcomes that are going to be essential to see the transformational change that we need. So, in bringing that uh, delivery framework to life, um, uh, let's have a look at some of the challenges facing our community in supporting sustainable development. Now, there are many, and I've picked out three here that I think are uh, some of the most pressing. The first is, how do we fund and design data collection? Unfortunately, seabed mapping is an expensive and complicated task. At the moment, 
whilst we have made some good inroads into primary data collection, it's only tackled discreetly as part of individual projects. And when we look at the enormity of the challenges that we faced, referring back to the sheer amount of the seabed globally that is yet to be systematically mapped, we can see that we can't get away from the fact that more funding is needed. So the second is ocean literacy, capability and capacity. Many of the developing nations that we're working with that identify as large ocean states lack the people and the tools to undertake seabed mapping for themselves. This combined with the fact that we lack a shared lexicon of how we talk about and describe the ocean environment makes it very difficult for us to move forward in a sustainable development context. This is something that needs to be improved. The third is data access and the economic integration of associated value chains. Now, the OECD are doing some amazing work in identifying the various value chains that blue data feeds into. But in a development context, and in order to move us towards those societal outcomes, we need to understand how to integrate those value chains successfully into the economic context of a developing nation. So before we look at some of the work that the UKHO has undertaken to support sustainable development, I'd like to introduce our primary charting authority portfolio. This portfolio is made up of over 70 nations from around the world that are utterly reliant upon us for the production of their navigational charts, which you could categorise as critical national infrastructure, but also increasingly reliant upon us for the provision of marine geospatial information to underpin economic growth and decision making within their governments. Now, the Hydrographic Programmes team from the UKHO has been working for the last five years with partners like the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office to deliver programmes and projects around the world, making interventions that focus on data collection, interpretation and provision to service these economic requirements. So the first case study I'd like to look at is Belize. Now, under the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme, led by the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, we undertook some seabed mapping activity in 2018 to support the production of new navigational charts in key areas where the data was really lacking. But what we did was we collected that data in a way that could be used by our project partners, the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science and the National Oceanography Centre, to do other work and to underpin other activities. Now lately, the National Oceanography Centre have taken that data and are in the process of producing habitat maps. What we've also done is present that information in a way beyond our traditional navigational charts in a thematic product that is designed to support coastal zone management. What we've also done is take the key stakeholders from Belize and work with them to develop um, a better and stronger hydrographic governance and what that will allow us to do is integrate those value chains that we were talking about more effectively into the government decision making process. And really exciting is that the data that we've collected is now being requested by a range of third parties, including the National Hurricane Centre from Miami, who have used it to update their for storm uh, forecast and inundation models. So the second case study I'd like to look at is Kiribati. Again, under the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme, in 2018, we developed a scoping study for the government to inform the development of an infrastructure project funded by the Asian Development Bank and World Banks. This project is focused at improving the maritime infrastructure in the outer islands of the Gilbert Group, which includes the, the capital of Kiribati, Tarawa. Now, what's really exciting about this project is that for the first time, we've worked with not only the government of a primary charting authority country, but also the international development finance community to position hydrography, seabed mapping and navigational charting as a part of critical national infrastructure alongside the more commonly recognised physical infrastructure of harbours, wharfs and jetties. This is the sort of partnership that I think we need to do more of as a community, especially if we're serious about meeting some of the higher order sustainable development goals. So in summary, I'd like to offer three approaches to consider in terms of how we can make sure that blue data is effectively supporting sustainable development. The first is funding data acquisition agnostic of its end use, but that also speaks to the design and delivery of these activities. If we do so, we can make sure that these incredibly important data sets actually service multiple uses and be used by many different stakeholder groups. 
The second is, how do we connect the international development finance community with our scientists? These two communities need to come together to co-design and co-implement these important interventions. So finally, we need to organise the Blue Data community to speak with a clear and coherent policy voice. We are going to need the support of governments from around the world if we are going to meet some of these challenges that are set out both through the UN decade and the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a really exciting time to be involved in ocean science and seabed mapping. And I hope as a community we can come together and deliver these shared aims. It's interesting to think about the central role that blue data plays across our sector. For example, how data taken from seabed mapping or the production of navigational charts can be used more widely. Not just in support of safe navigation, but activities such as fisheries management or disaster recovery efforts. We've heard today how valuable this data can truly be, both for economic development and sustainability. Even more so as we continue to work towards meeting our sustainable development goals as a community. As Sam mentioned, this is even more timely as we embark on the UN's Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And by working towards these shared goals, we believe this can have a positive and tangible impact on the lives of all of those who rely upon our oceans, both close to home and across the globe. Now it's your turn to give us some feedback. On your screen, you will see our live poll. We would like to know. Of the three recommendations made by Sam in today's talk on sustainable development, which do you believe could have the greatest impact? Funding data acquisition, regardless of its end use, increasing collaboration between finance and science communities, or ensuring the blue data community speaks with a single consistent policy voice. We're really interested to hear your views. Given the importance of collaboration across our community to achieve more sustainable development. Thank you everyone for giving us your input. Our experts are online to answer and review your comments, so please do continue to keep active on the live chat. Don't forget that we will be making all of today's sessions available on our website for you to watch, along with additional information and case studies on some of the topics discussed today, including our work in Belize and Kiribati as part of the CME programme. We will be posting a link in the live chat, so do take a look when you get a chance after the conference. That concludes our theme on data and sustainable development. We're going to take a short break and when we return, we will be turning our attention to the future of navigation, where our panels will discuss shipping's digital transformation and some of the big questions when it comes to autonomous navigation. Please join us then.
Welcome back everyone to the Admiralty Blue Data Conference. Let's now turn our attention to the future of navigation and how it is being redefined by shipping's digital and data transformation. To explore this subject, we have gathered experts across shipping, regulations and manufacturers to join our panel discussion. The IHO's S100 framework will play a fundamental role in transforming the way blue data is shared and how it's used for making decisions when navigating at sea. So as we welcome the next chapter of digital navigation, our panel will discuss some of the questions that face us, including what will passage planning look like in 2030? How are international standards evolving? And how can we use digital technologies to help all ocean activities safely coexist? I will now hand you over to Rear Admiral Rhett Hatcher, Director of Data Acquisition at the UKHO, who chaired the panel session. Hello everyone and welcome to our session on the future of navigation. I'm joined today by a panel of contributors who we've gathered to discuss how will shipping's digital revolution shape the next era of navigation technologies. I'm delighted to be joined by experts from across the maritime industry, each offering a unique perspective on this topic. To my far right, joining me today, I've got Peter Broadhurst from Imarsat Maritime. On my immediate right, Richard Doherty from CIRM. Moving to my left, Rakesh Pandit from the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. On his left, we've got Tom Meller, our own head of OEM tech support and digital standards here at the UKHO. And finally, Captain Sanchez Shrivista from OCIMF. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today, and it's particularly nice to be able to do this face-to-face -face for a change. Um, I'd like to open the discussion now with the first question, which is what will passage planning and navigation look like in 2030? Peter, can I ask you to open up the batting on that? Yeah, thank you very much, Red. Yeah, it's great to be here in the real world and not in the virtual world uh, for the last few months that we've been there. Um, I pick up on your point about the digital revolution. Um, I've been in maritime communications for a long time now, and digital has been a key buzzword. But in maritime, it's an evolution. We're moving forward slowly, and that's what generally happens in shipping. From Inmarsat's perspective, connectivity and, and providing that digital solutions has been around for a very long time. And What's not really happened is an embraced community within the maritime industry to take that digital solutions and improve the safety, the efficiency, and the effectiveness of digital to all seafarers and moving data backwards and forwards from the ship to shoreside decision making as well as on vessel decision making. Mm. So, holistically, we can improve the overall efficiency of maritime shipping, as well as improving the safety. And uh, that's really what I think that we need to, to focus on. How can this industry move forward? Embrace digital disruption, which doesn't mean the end of an industry. It means actually that the, the players in the industry will be adding different value. That's all it means. We embrace that and we can move forward and we can overall as I say, improve safety. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, can I come to you now, Richard, for your comments? Certainly, Rhett. I think by 2030, the global Im implementation of S100 is likely to be well underway, hopefully. And I think what that means is that numerous different digital data sets and overlays will be available to bridge teams to enhance all stages of the passage planning process. And if we think what that might look like, I think at the back of the bridge, we will have the physical nautical publications currently in use replaced with digital uh, layers. And I think there will be numerous new novel data sets delivered to planning computers for supporting, for example, uh, weather routing and other types of route optimization. I think at the front of the bridge, S100 will enable the integration of uh, digital data layers in ECTIS beyond those that are currently available on ENCs such as, for example, um, navigational warnings uh, or under keel clearance overlays, supporting uh, navigators in route planning, but also in route monitoring. Some other S100 product specifications under development that will positively impact passage planning include S421 route plan exchange, 
facilitating the interchange of S100 route plans between ship-based and shore-based systems, but also IEC 63173, which will specify a, sta a standardised service interface for the secure exchange of S100 data sets, importantly making sure that passage planning takes place in a cyber secure way. So I would say maybe in summary that S100 has the potential to improve all aspects of passage planning um, and in a way that will, as Peter says, enhance the safety of shipping but also the efficiency of operations because providing these, um, providing these data sets and integrating these digital layers across systems at the front and the back of the bridge will provide the users with seamless access to harmonised sets of rich data uh, and that will, in, in effect, reduce the administrative burden faced by bridge teams. Really clear, thanks. I think uh, you've really helped us understand some of the layers and, and the different audiences um, that we're all working for. Moving on to our next question, if I may, which is, how are international standards evolving to meet the needs of hydrographic, maritime and GIS users? Tom, I'd like to come to you first uh, for your opinions on that. Thank you, Rhett. Um, as everyone will know, and, and what we've just been talking about there, passage planning is a, a complex area. And for the mariner, assimilating all of that safety information together is a time-consuming task. They have to have the correct scale charts on their ECDIS systems for planning the route to identify navigational dangers. They have to get the tide tables and things like that so that they can make sure there's enough undercue clearance for the vessel. They have to have weather information. They have to have... Uh, the, the navigational warnings, like Richard was just talking about. And, and gathering together all of this disparate information takes time and there is a chance that that information may be lost or, or, or they may miss some safety information. Now, we've come a long way in 20 years and I must say it was S57's birthday recently um, and it's, it's celebrated its 20th anniversary in November. And, and we've done a significant job in providing an electronic navigational chart which can be used in ECDIS and is used on 40,000 vessels globally, daily, to transport goods around, around the world. But that standard is now creaking at the seams. Um, it's showing its age. And as a consequence, the IHO have been working on building a new data standard. And this data standard uh, is called S100, and Richard's already talked a little bit about that. Now... S100 is a new data framework and it's built on ISO standards, the ISO 19100 family of geographic information standards. And it encompasses a lot wider range of data than we ever had before within S57. And as an example, S100 now caters for data streaming. And this opens up the opportunity to potentially alter depth information directly from tide gauges as you're entering an exit port. So there's some significant benefits that S100 will bring. Now, S100 is the framework for hydrographic offices to build product specifications. And the IHO have been busy creating product specifications, as Richard said, for bathymetry, for tides, for navigation warnings. And, and all of these data layers will be combined together in the new ECTA systems to present a harmonised view for the mariner. And the reason that we're doing that is to simplify that job of passage planning, to bring together all those disparate information sources into one location and, and really give the mariner for the first time that, that simplified view, that safety view, um, and improve the, the situational awareness when they're in monitoring mode as well. So S100 will bring some significant advantages. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, and given that you've um, cross-referred, and Richard, you touched on it uh, in signposting in your previous injection, um, can I come to you for your thoughts on this? I think from the perspective of the Actus user, a common complaint relates to the variation in design across different models of Actus made by different manufacturers. In 2019, the International Maritime Organization, IMO, approved Circular 1609, which is entitled Guidelines on Standardization of User Interface Design for navigation equipment, the so-called S-mode circular. Key parts of that circular will become mandatory to implement on ECTIS, INS and radar from the 1st of January 2024 and from all other navigation displays on the bridge from the 1st of July 2025. And that will go uh, a long way to meeting the needs of the user in terms of improving usability of those systems. Another common complaint from ECTIS users but also from mariners in general relates to alarm fatigue caused by the increasing proliferation of alarms. 
The concept of bridge alert management, or BAM, BAM as it's known, has been around for years. And the IMO originally published the BAM performance standards in 2010. Um, briefly, the concept of BAM is to enhance the handling and presentation of alerts um, to assist the bridge team in their decision making. And it uh, curtails redundant or superfluous audible and visual uh, alarm announcements, uh, reducing the cognitive load on the operator by minimizing the amount of information presented that's required to assess the situation. Um, however, only recently has a technical standard been developed that will allow the equipment manufacturers to comply with the IMO's BAM requirements. And so now all of those individual testing standards are being updated to include reference to the IMO, uh, to this, this technical standard, which uh, effectively means that eventually all new bridge equipment will comply with the IMO's BAM requirements, thereby greatly improving the situation on board when it comes to the proliferation of alarms and the concerns around alarm fatigue. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm particularly glad that you touched on some of the, the, the tech and equipment aspects uh, of that, that, that topic because it leads us helpfully in, into our next question, um, which, if I may, is how do we enable the technological and navigational advances shipping needs to unlock new opportunities and advance efficiencies? And with that uh, in mind, can I ask you, Sanjay, to perhaps provide a, your, your mariner's perspective to that question? I guess uh, principles of navigation do not change. And I'd like to agree with some of my fellow panelists that they need to keep evolving. And if you look at the last 20 years, the way technology has evolved, already there's a lot of adapting that has happened in the seafarer and the marina community in trying to adapt to ever-changing technology. Now, what we really need to keep our focus on is what is the mariner and the operator interface going to look like? And what are the unintended consequences of uh, evolution of technology? Now, we already know about things that Richard just mentioned about alarm fatigue. We're also aware about uh, over-reliance of technology. Um, and also dilution of navigational skills and principles amongst the seafarer community. But the most important is we've also aware of technology-induced errors, thereby leading to pretty significant navigational incidents. So we have a lot of challenges that we need to overcome. What we really need to keep in, in focus is the, the user interface, the focus on safety of navigation, and how changes and advancements in technology is going to overcome these challenges. Now, even as we speak, there is increasing level of automation on board ships. And uh, uh, sometimes we need to kind of really keep the focus on human, uh, human machine interface and try and preempt what could be the unintended consequences. And once we've overcome those challenges, I'm pretty positive that in advancements in technology, along with advanced data analytics, will lead to real coexistence of you know, uh, of technology along with the marinas and lead to better, safer and cleaner environment and the oceans. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, really interesting. Um, Tom, I'm sure you have a view on data sets in this sphere. Over to you. Uh, I think a really good example of how the technology is changing and what we're providing now for mariners to support um, vessels coming in and out of port is the bathymetric surface, S102. Now, S102 is being created to support uh, vessels, larger vessels coming in and out of port where there's a requirement to have much higher resolution data than ever before. And as a consequence, there's less under keel clearance for those vessels coming in and out of port. So mariners need that, that enhanced view so that they can improve their safety, make sure they're not getting into dangerous areas. The, the concept of the bathymetric surface is very simple. It's a grid of points which can be altered by the hydrographic office to either uh, increase the resolution or decrease the resolution. And attached to each of those grid points is a depth. And that depth can either be the calculated depth that was measured by the survey crew, or it can be shell biased by a hydrographic office to be used for navigation. Now, one of the principal benefits of using an ECDIS system, as everyone will know, is setting the safety contour. But using a traditional ENC, there is a rigid set of contours that the ECDIS system can use. And this means that if you were navigating and you put in an 11 metre safety contour, that value isn't available in the ENC information, so it has to default to the 20 metre contour. But that's not the case if you're using an S102 bathymetric surface. That surface will be able to 
clearly delineate for the mariner the safe and dangerous areas. Now, the benefit of that for the user is obviously the increased safety, but there's a benefit also for ports who will be able to, if they collect this high resolution survey information, bring larger vessels in. And also there's a, obviously a, a, an advantage for commercial shipping as they may be able to load more cargoes onto their vessels. So as you can see, that, that data set, I think, which will be used in precision navigation, will really start to um, provide technological advances for the, the shipping industry. Thanks, Tom. Um, really helpful expansion for us. Um, given Sancho and, and Tom's points, Peter, are we going to be able to connect all this up? Well, uh, right. actually, I would say we are already connected, um, in all fairness. Um, the issue has been that connectivity has always been seen as a, as a cost center. And, uh, and so the actual engagement in communications to increase safety and the return on investment for digitalization has, has been a barrier. We see vessels transmitting terabytes of data at the top end, the really engaged shipping companies. And then we see vessels with a few megabytes of data at the low end. And, and so without this kind of strong infrastructure of the right way forward, and I applaud the initiative that's coming from um, the S100 in terms of trying to improve the safety. And if we don't have this holistic kind of bringing it all together across shipping, then we will always have a little bit of a disconnect. And, and, and I think that's where we have this kind of issue that we need to get through. This is where we need to, how do we really engage shipping to embrace communications to enable what we first started out by talking, which was the digital revolution. And um, there's a lot that's going on at this moment in time where, where digital is the underlying thread, the modernization of GMDSS, the, the, all of the, the, the stuff that's happening in FAL and in, in STCW, it's all got this digital aspect to it and you need connectivity for that. So uh, I believe we are in a connected uh, maritime community, it's just how do we develop it and grow it forward. And so turning to our final question, which is, in ever busier oceans, how can we use digital technologies to help all ocean activities to safely coexist? And I'd like to come to you, Rakesh, uh, for your opinion and perhaps a, an MCA perspective as well. Uh, yes, uh, definitely I'll be happy to give uh, not just uh, MCA perspective, I, I believe it's a wider perspective, uh, even from IMO, I would say. Uh, let me take the example of GMDSS and how GMDSS concept is being enriched will be enriched, uh, probably already is to quite a degree, by new technologies, new digital technologies, digital data transfers, uh, being much faster, much simpler, uh, much more data, but even cheaper and sustainable. You know, as, as we all know, um, Apollo 13 probably had similar power as your uh, smartphone now. But you have similar power or, or similar technological power or sim similar c computing power, but far less carbon footprint, something like that. GMDS is being one example where uh, it is being uh, reviewed. The whole concept of GMDS is, is in a comprehensive review since the last few years at IMO. And a couple of things which stand out from there are uh, VDES and NavDet. Uh, VDES as in VHF Data Exchange System, NavDet as in uh, fully digitized or fully digital NavTex. And it is simply said, uh, and my technological friends will agree here, that VDES is uh, supposedly got to be uh, uh, AIS on steroids, <laughs> and uh, NavDAD is supposedly going to be NavTax on steroids, all with a still smaller carbon footprint. So I think that this way the technological advancement, the fact that technology can put together more power and smaller data sets, and that these data sets being uh, harmonized to start with, I think that is the um, non-disruptive 
part of technological advances helping, even though the technology itself is disruptive technology. Rakesh, thank you so much. Um, Peter, what are your thoughts on this, our safe coexistence here? Yeah, thank you. And that was some very interesting comments from Rakesh, especially around GMDSS, because our main role is safety. Uh, and uh, and Inmarsat's been providing satellite GMDSS for 40 years. Um, I think we've missed a little bit of a, a technology introduction within that, in the, in the review of it, because GMDSS is very reactive. We should be more proactive. With digital solutions, there's no reason why we can't be looking at the depth contours on a vessel, identifying vessels in the wrong position, uh, the voyage planning, uh, when a vessel goes astray, and all those kind of things. There's no reason why we can't be on top of this now. In terms of where we want to go is the question. It's not so much what we can do, because we can do it. It's, it, it as I say, there's lots of application providers out there, entrepreneurs providing these solutions. And we've, we are connecting shoreside infrastructure with sh ship infrastructure and removing that fatigue, making decisions for people. That's, that's what we're all trying to do here. It's, it's, uh, I mentioned to Richard, alarm fatigue. It's people fatigue, really. Yeah. We create alarms, but the fatigue is on the person. It's on the navigator. And we're trying to take that away. And um, I think we can be more proactive with our digital solutions. And that drives safety. And, you know, and, and as I say, my, my big thing about safety is 360,000 people a year drown at sea. And there's no need for that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do today, is use digital, part of this digital revolution, to move the industry forward so we don't have the accidents. Yeah. Because the drownings at sea are reported yeah. kind of vaguely, but the accidents on ships, we don't really know. Yeah. And we're just getting into that with crew welfare. And, and, uh, and the, the things that are coming out, again, through the IMO and other charities that are looking at seafarers and the fatigue they go through and the stress they're under. And digital can play a big part in removing that and making our seas safer, not for just the people that are on it, but also for everybody who's involved in it. And that's, I think that's a challenge to the industry on how we need to move forward. Uh, Sanchez, clearly some... Um, some there's Plenty of opportunities in this sphere, but not without challenge. What do you think? No, thank you. It's really encouraging to see that, you know, there's conscious efforts being taken towards enhancing, improving safety of uh, navigation and uh, how technology is going to play an ever-increasing role uh, in making sure that that happens. Now, one of the challenges, as you said, increasing traffic density globally, but also there is weather, changes in weather patterns. Uh, and... and uh, the, the human factors related uh, aspects that also need to be kind of considered. But uh, what we really need to probably focus on is uh, the reliability of systems that we are going to introduce, uh, build sufficient redundancy within those systems, and make sure that there is repeatability in terms of user experience. So as an operator or a marina or seafarer moves from one uh, sphere to another, the repeatability of the experience is not one of the challenges that leads to whether it's improper decision making or a contributory factor to future incidents or accidents. Now, I really think there is a great opportunity here in terms of enhancing the way we integrate information into the user experience and how do we really enhance the quality of decision making in, in, in in, in integrating that information into the human machine interface. And really, in summary, I can't really overemphasize the need, uh, the, the urgent need to maintain and, 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 and constantly keep the focus on, on operator stroke seafarer training uh, in ensuring a re robust reliability of systems uh, and an unrelenting focus on uh, the human machine interface and the underlying systems and conditions that people will go through uh, with the uh, ever-increasing technology. Thanks very much, Sanchez. Well, I'm afraid uh, we're out of time, and so it falls to me to draw this session to a close. Um, I feel as if we've only just scraped the surface of what is an iceberg-sized topic, um, but I know that the panel will have prompted um, significant thought uh, and would certainly hope that that will manifest in ongoing discussion and work beyond this conference. Gentlemen, thank you so much again for sharing your time and expertise with us here today.
Thank you, Rhett. And thank you to all the panellists for sharing their thoughts on such relevant issues for our industry. It's really interesting to hear more about the outlook for passage planning and navigation in 10 years' time, as well as the evolution of international standards and how they can help meet the needs of hydrographic data users. Our panellists raised some thought-provoking points on how we can improve connectivity and enable the technological advances that the marine sector needs to unlock further commercial and research opportunities. Now our final session tackles one of the most exciting developments in our industry, autonomous navigation. The possibility of partially or fully autonomous ships promises to be transformative for the maritime industry. By 2030, we estimate the autonomous shipping sector to be worth a staggering £111 billion and employ more than 554,000 people worldwide. And central to the development of such vessels is blue data to support safe and efficient navigation. Our next panel will discuss some of the big questions on this topic. They will explore the key benefits uncrewed vessels can bring to the shipping industry and the wider blue economy. The innovations needed to enable this change and how autonomous ships will fit with the existing regulatory framework. The panel is led by Alastair Pettigrew from Blue Communications, who will now introduce our panellists. Hello and welcome to uh, UK Hydrographic Office hosted panel discussion. Today we'll be focused on autonomous navigation and I'm delighted to welcome uh, an esteemed panel. Uh, starting with Dan Hook. Dan is Managing Director of Ocean Infinity. Katrina Kemp. Katrina is Smart Ships and Automation Policy Officer for the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. And Mark Casey, Head of Research, Design and Innovation at the UK Hydrographic Office. So I'm going to start with Dan. Uh, Dan, I have a couple of questions for you pertaining to the benefits of autonomous vessels and particularly what they bring to shipping and the wider blue economy. And in addition to that, um, if you could give us a little bit of insight into the innovations you are seeing that enable this change. Great, thanks Alistair, um, good, good questions. Um, so uh, in terms of the first one, I mean, I, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to, to have been working in the unmanned boat um, industry working on various sort of sizes and shapes of vessels for, for nearly 20 years. And I guess in every case, it's really important to weigh up the pros and cons of, of unmanned operations or, or or more recently, as we've referred to them as uncrewed operations. Um, but I think I'm, I'm confident and, and convinced that sort of over time, there has been a sort of a steady increase in the number of cases where there really is a true net benefit. Um, uh, and most notably, I think these can be the lowering of CO2 emissions. So quite often with robotic operations, there's a chance to use a slightly lighter or smaller vessel to achieve the same task and um, burning less fuel. Certainly, there's the opportunity to cut sort of offshore hotel power consumption. And, and this can be really quite significant on some tasks. There's the opportunity to lower offshore HSE exposure. Um, it, it speaks for itself, but... It can be very significant, um, particularly in multi-boat operations and, and in certain areas of the world with, with challenging climate, sea states or sort of social political challenges. Um, cutting HSE exposure is high on everyone's list. Um, and then finally, I think just overall operational efficiency. Um, I've certainly seen quite a few cases at sea now where unmanned vessels have offered a, an overall efficiency on a task, been able to gather more data, do the task more efficiently, more quickly. Some of this is from long endurance. Some of this is from algorithms and tools in software. Um, just an overall efficiency that comes with robotics is, is a pretty strong case, isn't it? And it's building more and more evidence. Um, in terms of the innovations that sort of enable this, this benefit to continue, um, certainly in my work initially with ASV and, and, and more recently with Ocean Infinity, um, I've always put a total emphasis on, on safety. Um, and I think I see a lot of opportunities for ongoing R&D innovation to, to further enhance this. A particular topic is um, the development of, of, of ever richer um, navigational models. So um, extra layers of information, extra means that, that can, the, the machines, the robots can interpret, interpret that data. 
Um, clearly a big topic for the UKHO and, and this event. I think there's still a lot of progress to be made in engineering around communication optimization um, and how we integrate with these new satellite constellations becoming available to us. On the human side, um, and this links back to the, the comment about rich sort of world models, there's a lot of opportunity to improve how we do operational planning, training, simulation, um, and some of this links to opportunities like augmented reality. Um, there's certainly work to do across the board in remote systems with how we monitor uh, reliability, plan maintenance, uh, the management of onboard engineering systems remotely, um, some quite exciting developments going on in that space, and some huge data sets being generated for, for interpretation. So I think in general, the, the sort of uncrewed and, and lean crewed um, vessel industry is, is coming of age. Um, there's some exciting deliveries in the next few years. Um, and I think it's going to have a huge sort of benefit towards this, this, this total blue economy. Thanks very much, Dan. Mark, turning to you, a couple of questions, if I may. Why can't autonomous vessels travel using existing navigational products? Uh, and second question, what data can support the safe and efficient navigation of autonomous vessels? Uh, yeah, great question there. If I take the first one, um, so the main area of concern centers around a lack of regulation or rules or standards relating to navigational data in an autonomous vessel. So whilst autonomous vessels will become aware of their surroundings and use sense and avoid technologies, these vessels still need to navigate, uh, get navigational data to go from A to B, avoid key areas or operate differently when entering a specific region such as a port. Uh, to suggest that autonomous vessels will be able to use current chart is inappropriate for the following reasons. ENCs are still fundamentally designed to be viewed and interpreted by a human being and are used to inform the mariner and help them make decisions uh, based on the chart information, their knowledge, their extensive training, what they see out the window and even the pitch and roll of the actual vessel itself. Uh, ENCs are made using traditional cartographic practices which can be subjective in nature and therefore they're only a representation of ground truth and we occasionally have data inconsistencies which mariners can identify and resolve. ENCs also suffer from horizontal inconsistencies, specifically edge matching issues and we often see discontinuation of data when transitioning from one ENC to another quite often as a result of different scale bands, but human beings again can identify this and resolve it. Uh, ENCs also don't contain wider contextual information that mariners need to make safe decisions, such as the information contained in sailing directions or radio signals, or even that which is sometimes displayed as notes on the edge of a chart. This information is really crucial to mariners as these notes often describe the kind of rules of the road, if you like, and describe restrictions or constraints uh, that mariners need to follow uh, when entering a specific region, such as a port. Um, we can't encode this data in an ENC because the, the standard is 20 years old and it's locked down. Therefore, new navigation data services that are rich in data and detail and can be machine readable and interpretable are needed. So if I pick up on your second point, at the UKHO, we've worked with a number of autonomous vessel operators, builders and system integrators to understand what data is needed moving forward. And it's become quite clear that there are a number of key data sets uh, that are crucial to safe navigation for an autonomous vessel. The most obvious one is high resolution grid and bathymetry, as opposed to the derived 10 meter interval, uh, interval contours that we show on charts today. Uh, another key element is tidal height and tidal streams. Today, tidal data is provided to mariners in applications where they click on a tidal station for an area that they're interested in and for a particular time. But an autonomous vessel will need machine-to-machine -machine data interoperability and require access to real-time data to ensure it can enter a restricted waterway or port. And finally, it will be involved uh, capturing a machine-readable format, all that textual, contextual data that I talked about, and making that available to autonomous vessels to ensure they are conforming to the rules of a specific region. And these new data sets will not only make navigation for large autonomous vessels safer, but all could also help route optimization, therefore lead to more efficient operations and reduce emissions and pollution. Mark, thank you for that. Um, one more question. How could we make navigational and other data more interoperable for autonomous vessels? 
So I think ultimately the answer has to be the use of maritime geospatial standards. And for me, the new IGOS 100 suite of navigation data sets could pave the way and facilitate autonomous vessel navigation. So the S100 suite of navigation data sets are designed to be interoperable with each other. Think of them as, as layers of data that together make a full enhanced picture of the maritime landscape. That said, the S100 standards are still really designed to be viewed by the next generation of Ectis. However, they do have high degree of detail, such as S102, which is high resolution grid bathymetry, and S104, which allows for real-time tidal events, which could be made into machine-readable formats. These standards are still fairly immature, and we're a few years away from seeing these standards being readily available. But we're probably also a few years away from seeing large autonomous vessels sailing around the globe. And I think that these two areas of development are likely to start to reach a level of maturity that could complement each other. As I've mentioned in our work with autonomous vessel operators, there is a, an S100 equivalent to most of the data sets that we get asked for. So I've already mentioned S102 for grid bathymetry, S104 for tidal heights, but there's other key S100 standards that will, will be instrumental, such as S111 for surface currents, S122 for marine protected areas, S121 for maritime limits and boundaries. So indeed, S100 should address 8% of the problems I mentioned earlier with the current navigation products and services, allowing for innovation that kind of remaining 20%. And one area we're looking at is around position, navigation and timing or GPS denied environments. And at the UKHO, we've started some work with the University of Swansea to employ computer vision and machine learning to automate celestial navigation for deep ocean and the automated identification of visually conspicuous coastal objects to obtain accurate position of fixing when in close proximity to the shoreline. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, there's clearly a tremendous amount of hard work and progress uh, going into data development in particular around autonomous navigation, but it's probably a good time for a bit of a sense check uh, and bringing you in, Katrina. Um, how, how will autonomous vessels sit within the regulatory framework? What are you seeing? Um, obviously, when the regulations and guidance were developed, um, autonomous or remotely operated vessels were not considered. They weren't on the scene. Um, our job is to support industry and ensure that when these vessels are tested and operating, they do so safely. And as, as everyone's quite rightly said, the regulations aren't out there for that right now. So our approach is very much about providing exemptions or equivalents to those regulations. But obviously, we need to do more than that. And in the longer term, we need to, quite simply, update the regulations. Um, it's easier said than done. And but right now, we are working to update the workboat code, which looks at under 24 metre vessels. Um, and we hope to add an annex that specifically looks at what requirements are needed for those remotely operated vessels. Um, what we need to do is make sure that these vessels are safe, but we also need to make sure those regulations are flexible because as Dan and Mark have already explained, there is, there's a lot of development taking place. Things are still moving. We're not settled on where that technology is. So we need to ensure that any requirements we put into a regulation, such as the workboat code, have the flexibility to adapt and take into consideration new technologies that will be hitting the market and maturing in the next couple of years. Obviously, beyond that, the bigger picture is those vessels that are larger than 24 metres. What do we need to do there? What regulations do we need to be looking at? And also beyond remote operation, those more fully autonomous vessels, what considerations do we need to look at there in terms of data, communications, that machine to machine inoperability that was just spoken about? And it's worth highlighting, because this is the maritime environment, we also need to consider the international perspective. And we're working with IMO to incorporate autonomous vessels into the international regulatory framework, and not just within the maritime safety, but also the legal and the facilitation. And it's not going to be an easy task, but everyone I speak to all support that this is what needs to happen to ensure these vessels can operate and safely. Thank you very much, Katrina. Uh, there's clearly uh, a lot of very exciting development taking place. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for contributing to a really interesting and insightful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. 
Thank you, Alistair, for leading this conversation. And thanks to all our participants for sharing these brilliant insights into the future of autonomous shipping and its implications for safety, efficiency and marine data collection. By continuing the key research already underway by the UKHO and our partners, we can discover even more benefits that uncrewed vessels could bring to shipping and the wider blue economy. It's really exciting to see the different ways in which autonomous shipping could lead to substantial progress in blue data collection and analysis, and to consider how these advantages would sit within the existing regulatory framework. And now for the final vote of the conference. As we've heard today, we're entering a new era for the future of navigation and a new era for ECDIS. The IHO's new S100 data standard will allow for more and richer types of data to be displayed on ECDIS. And so we would like to ask you the following question. In addition to S101 ENCs, which S10X product would you consider to be the most beneficial to navigation using an ECDIS? S102 or bathymetric surface, which provides increased safety margins for vessels over traditional ENCs. S104, or water level information for service navigation, providing tides and water levels in real time or as predictions. S111, for surface currents, a grid to indicate the speed and direction of surface currents. S123, or marine radio services, used to indicate the location, availability and frequencies of radio communications. Or finally, S124, or navigational warnings, developed for data sets containing navigational warning information, primarily targeting use in ECDIS. Thank you for your voting. As our panellists discussed earlier, this is an exciting time for the sector as we realise the benefits of the next generation of ECDIS systems. All that remains for me to do is say a heartfelt thank you to you all for your time, your questions, your feedback, and most of all, your support at this critical time for our seas and oceans. We have only just entered the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, and we hope to continue our work with you all to help achieve our shared goals and together keep addressing the big marine questions. Do continue to follow the conversation on our social media platforms with the hashtag Marine Questions. Our website will also provide access to the talks and panel discussions you have seen today, as well as further information which we have just linked to the live chat. And for any of your questions and comments that our experts were unable to answer today, look out for our follow-up content on the Admiralty website, where we will try and address as many of your questions posed to us in the live chat. Innovation, collaboration and blue data are the cornerstones of our vision for supporting safe, secure and thriving oceans. And so we look forward to continuing to work with you to help step closer to realising this vision. And now it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Catherine Armour, who you heard from at the start of the broadcast. Catherine will share her insight into what the future holds for the UKHO and the wider marine community as our conference comes to a close. Thank you for joining us today and take care. I hope that you have all enjoyed the discussions and findings of our Blue Data Conference. We're proud, despite the challenges of the pandemic, to have been able to gather some of the leading minds across our ocean industries to hold these important and timely discussions. I'd like to thank both them and you for joining us. Today, we've heard something of the urgency and scale of the challenges that we face. As we come to the end of this gathering, I think it is right for us to reflect on the key learnings from today's events. At the beginning of the conference, I mentioned the three things we all hold in common, that we care about our seas and oceans, that we're all united behind the need to protect our marine resources, and that we all believe that marine data and data science are a crucial part of the solutions we require. I believe that today's discussions will have strengthened our shared view. We've heard about some of the key advances being made in sustainable development, new data standards, the blue economy and full vessel autonomy. 
We've heard about some of the novel ways that mean we're now able to gather a vast resource of marine geospatial data, providing new insights into the state of our oceans. And we've heard how marine data, when used to understand the nature of these challenges we face, can empower decision makers to make the choices we need to preserve our delicate ocean ecosystems. It's also been fabulous to see so many of your comments and questions in the live chat and your participation in today's polls, which I think exemplifies the interest and passion for the topics from all corners of our ocean community. For me, it's been particularly encouraging to hear of the multiple ways in which blue data can unlock value from economic and societal to scientific and developmental. And likewise, our increasing dependence on and the criticality of emerging digital technologies and data accessibility across all themes. In this UN decade of ocean science, the steps that we have to take are now clearer than ever before. We've seen that building a thriving blue economy not only requires data, but perhaps more crucially, collaboration and teamwork. For me, this is the central theme of all that we've discussed today. As ocean data leaders, we will achieve more by working together than we can by working alone. At the UKHO, we do this through engagement and collaboration with our passionate network of distributors, licensees, technical partners, data suppliers, and challenge participants. I'd particularly like to thank and recognize our distributors for the crucial role you play in getting our solutions into the hands of the mariner. The level of commitment and professionalism, professionalism you show, particularly during tough times, is integral to keeping them safe at sea. We will continue this collaboration to deliver data products and services for new solutions as new technologies and standards emerge. Collaboration builds our shared success, further solutions to bigger challenges and delivers greater impact than can be achieved when working in isolation. I'm proud of the work I see being done across our sector to enable and ensure the use of accurate and trusted marine geospatial data. And I'm excited for the future of our oceans and ocean communities. As the world emerges from the challenges of 2020, as a new decade dawns, I urge ocean data leaders to take a new central role, enabling safe, secure and thriving oceans. I believe that if we continue to work to this shared purpose, we will be able to unlock a brighter, better, more sustainable future for our oceans protecting these vital ecosystems and creating the ocean industry of tomorrow. So once again, thank you for joining us today.